r slash no sleep. Posted by you slash Pappy. Strange. Life. Clinical Trial 87. Part 1. I'm not a good man. Felt it. That's what they say when a professional poker player goes broke. No more chips, just down to the felt of the table. I was beyond felted. Six months ago, I was betting and winning upwards of 10 grand a hand. 20 years I'd honed my skills, a predator always circling the fish. I don't know if I'd overshot the moon and started to take on players beyond my skill set or if what we call variance and you call luck just went against me. Could be one, could be the other, could be both. It didn't matter. Same result. The deck was firmly stacked against me, and all that was left to drink away the memories. I was in deep with the worst kind of loan sharks. The kind who don't just break a few fingers. These guys really knew how to hurt. They'd rape your friend just to torture you over a few grand. And the vig was running, always running, at some obscene percent contrived from their gorilla math. Sharks. I remember when I was the shark. Now I was leaking blood in the water. So I signed up for clinical trial 87. A trial that claimed countless lives and forever fundamentally changed who, what I was. The trial I survived. I write this now to reveal myself to the world. For those who might follow me. For those who should. The phone interview had been mind-numbingly long and painfully invasive but for some reason, I was chosen. I knew it was too good to be true. A vague ad in the paper. Some shell company paying far too much for a medical trial that didn't even involve drugs? If it smells like rotting meat, there's probably a corpse in there. But I needed the money. And whatever horrifying physical torment these scientists could devise would pale compared to what awaited me on the outside. So I signed up. Four patients. Four days. We surrendered everything we had when we arrived at a nondescript medical facility sneakily tucked inside what appeared to be an abandoned commercial district on the outskirts of the city. Everything was white, shockingly white, the kind of white that insisted its way into your mind and gave you a headache. And the smell of chemical sanitizers made us choke and cough. Nameless workers wearing scrubs and masks gave us the rundown. I figured they had to be doctors or academics of some sort. The unnecessarily large words, the slight air of scumbag entitlement. We were to sleep in the community room. Each day, one of us would undergo the trial with the team and then return to sleep. On the fourth day, everyone could leave. I wasn't half as worried that they searched us three times as I was when I realized they never gave us any follow-up instructions. The typical reporting requirements. Every so often, we'll have you come in to check. Just that we could leave. Curt, abrasive. It made me nervous. The last two instructions were that we were allowed to discuss anything and everything, strange, and that we had to sign what looked like a truckload of waivers. Cursory glances over the legalese told me we were probably waiving everything under the sun, our very lives freely given. I didn't care. Any monster in here wasn't half as scary as what was waiting for me out there. That's the gamble. You wait the options, assess the risk, and roll it with it. The four of us settled into the community room. Katerina was quiet, kind, and sharp, but couldn't hide the track marks on her arms and the scrubs they gave us. Mark was a bald, angry middle-aged man who huffed and puffed and blew nothing down. Jasmine was energetic and full of life, a college student hellbent on becoming a leading anthropologist. And me, Tom, the wandering artist soaking up life. My name isn't Tom and I sure as hell am no artist. I hustle for a living. The team never mentioned anything about having to stick to the truth. There are no friends at the poker table. They took Mark back first. Katerina, Jasmine, and I all breathed a collective sigh of relief. Mark was far older than the rest of us, and the insufferable know-it-all who knew nothing but forced his undesired presence on everyone. At least we could chill for the day. We shot the breeze and told stories from our lives. I wonder if theirs were true. There was no clock or sense of time among the glaring white paint and ungodly gleam of the fluorescent lights in the community room, but we all agreed we were getting tired, so it had to be getting late. They'd fed us a decent meal a few hours before. We were just getting bored and taking bets on when Mark would return when the door flew open and he waltzed right in. The door slammed behind him. Something was different about him. His eyes kept darting and his fingers wiggled like coral caught in an undercurrent. Given my background, I tend to pay close attention to detail, and I would have bet at least a grand he had green eyes. These eyes darting, never resting, assessing every inch of our little box, were an impossibly light blue. We asked him about the trial. After all, they were insistent we could talk about, anything dot backslash. I was expecting some sort of long-winded, pompous speech, but it was like he was a new person. Concise. Friendly. 
Down to earth. Like all the mundane insecurities underlying his asshole personality had been stripped away. He said it was easy breezy with a warm smile. Actually, kind of fun. Apparently, all you did was sit alone in a room with a table in a comfy chair and listen to a strange word being played on repeat for hours on end. He said the word was being played on a loop by an AI voice that sounded like it was straight out of bad 1980s sci-fi. Mark gave me a friendly clap on the back, looking relaxed and years younger, spry, and said you got to do whatever you wanted while it played. He'd asked for crossword puzzles, a fishing magazine, and a few tuna sandwiches, and voila, they delivered. What was the word? I had to ask. I thought it was natural. Mark's countenance became cloudy, sharp and angry. I can't tell you that. There's, a lot I can't tell you. They make you sign more papers saying you won't tell. And I won't. It didn't sound like Mark was angry at the prospect of not being paid. He sounded, possessive. Like the word belonged to him and I'd cross the line. Sorry, Mark, I didn't realize. That's my mistake. His features softened once more, and he laughed it off with gusto. We all hit the hay soon after. Sleep came easily. Until the screaming started. I don't know how long we'd been asleep, but we all leapt out bed. Mark was in the middle of the room. Blood was gushing from his eyes. His black eyes, darker than obsidian. He was painting symbols in the floor with his own blood, wailing and rocking and screaming a completely unintelligible word. We tried to calm him but he was entranced. I decided screw calm, time to get rough. That was a mistake. His head snapped at me, and fire spewed from his eyes. A life of dipping and dodging had taught me well, but not well enough. All I felt, all I saw, was white hot pain. The bottom of my right ear lobe, throat, and shoulder were burnt to a crisp. I screamed and writhed in agony. Smelled my own burning flesh. Tom Flambe. Mark began some absurd dance, bobbing up and down, moving in a circle, screaming the same word over and over and over and over and over. Fire sprayed from his eyes, jettisoned from his mouth, soared from his fingertips. There was nothing in the room but some chairs, a small table, and the beds. All caught in the maelstrom. All caught in the raging inferno. Everything burns. I could hardly see or breathe. Somehow I saw Jasmine slamming on the door, her back badly charred, heard the distant echoes of her pleading. Katerina was in the fetal position in a corner, nursing her left hand, sobbing. Our world was an oven, and we were the meat. Would we suffocate in the smoke first or become roast desperation, the hot new dish on the menu? Smart money said suffocate. I figured two to one. And the last damn word we were ever going to hear was whatever babble Mark was screaming. I accepted my fate. Fatalism is a necessary element of poker, to gambling, and you simply must embrace it when you have no outs. That was, until Mark became perfectly still and silent. He fell to his knees. Sprinklers jumped forward from previously unseen positions in the ceiling. Water and some foamy chemical suppressant sprayed everywhere, stealing the life from the fire. The door opened and doctors rushed in. They put oxygen masks on all of us, began treating our burns. None of them touched or looked at Mark. None of them said a word to any of us, no matter how much we screamed or quietly pleaded. Morphine, sweet hospital heroin, started dripping into me, from a syringe jabbed into my arm. The last thing I remember passing out into a deep sleep was Mark looking at me. His eyes gone, now hollowed out sockets rimmed with seared flesh. I heard him say with perfect clarity what sounded like. Imarazif Eftkin. As the warm arms of slumber took me, I saw him fall over dead. Posted by you slash pappy. Strange. Life. Clinical Trial 87. Part 2. We awoke on day 2, the opiate fog still swirling in our heads. Mark was gone. The entire room had been refurnished, and our wounds had clearly been extensively treated. There was no sign a fire had ever been here, no lingering smell of smoke or scorched marks. Not a single remnant of the inferno could be found. Just a blinding new coat of white paint and the overwhelming smell of chemical cleaners. Jasmine and Katerina whispered conspiratorially. Katerina looked healthier, despite her bandaging. I guess getting her fix helped. Guys. It doesn't matter if we whisper. They can hear us. So, we either don't talk or they hear us. We're locked in some fucked up experiment where a guy burned away half my fucking ear with fire from his eyes. I'm pretty sure they're going to be prepared for fucking whispering. Mask off. Now was not the time to sugarcoat. Not now. Do, do you think they knew? Jasmine was shaking. I looked her squarely in the eye. 
She was smart, smarter than I was ever going to be, but she was used to outwitting a teacher, the safe confines of academia. Fear was smothering any clarity in that brain of hers. Of course. How, how can you know that? You don't know that. You, you can't be sure. Katerina was almost pleading, her voice tiny, dripping with fear and pain. Those sprinklers? That phone? Guys, they burst through the door wearing oxygen tanks and gas masks. What does that say to you? They were prepared for fire. That seemed to click in both of their brains, but much to my chagrin, only caused more panic. They simultaneously bolted for the door, beating on it, screaming, demanding, threatening. So much for poker faces. I sunk into a fresh chair. You can't control entropy. You can't wrangle disorder. You can make all the right moves and still lose. I figured I'd just enjoy the general lack of pain while I could and let them dance this futile jig. I wasn't going to play a rig game I couldn't win. I'd done enough of that in this wasted life. Two hours later, they dragged Jasmine away, kicking and screaming, begging us to help her. They left Katerina and I food. We ate in silence. She wouldn't look me in the eye. I'm sure she thought me a coward for not trying to fight them off, escape, protect Jasmine. It was kind of hard to miss the fact they came in armed to invade Poland this time. Time ticked away and I thought about all the poker hands where it went wrong. The bad beats played on a loop in my mind. You can never remember the victories, but the unfair defeats remain forever etched. I miss the feeling of shoving a few thousand into the middle of the table, saying all in with a voice bereft of emotion. It was a far fall from there to here. I tried not to think what the lone sharks would do to the few people left in my life when they assumed I skipped town. I guess when you're dead it isn't really your problem anymore. Jasmine came back a few hours later. Her eyes were the same color. But I was damn positive she didn't have a tattoo on her forehead when she left. It was a symbol, a single symbol, unlike anything I'd ever seen. The closest thing it resembled was a rune, but that wasn't right. Like a rune, a Greek letter, and a crude drawing of a brain had been smashed together. We asked her what they did to her. But she was off. Way off. Aggressive. Rude. Bitter. The chipper academic was gone, replaced by just animalistic id. She wouldn't tell us anything other than she listened to a word. Even that she barked at us as she flipped over a bed with a crash. Katerina and I sauntered away, slinking into our respective corners. Jasmine never stopped pacing, vividly throwing her arms over her head, flailing about like a badly animated cartoon character. She muttered acidic threats of violence to no one, her voice growing more feral with each turn. Eventually, sleep took me. Even the returning pain of my burns couldn't stave off the exhaustion. We roused from sleep by hellish screams. Jasmine was spinning impossibly fast on one foot, pirouetting like a prima ballerina. Her right hand and head were raised to the heavens, absolutely shrieking the same unintelligible word over and over. We didn't try and calm or comfort her. I certainly didn't try to get firm this time. Truth be told, we just cowered and watched the frenetic dance, even as blood leaked from her hospital slipper. Without warning, she stopped and snapped her head toward Katerina. Screaming the same babble with a now hoarse voice, she fell to her knees, arched her back until you could hear bones started to crack, and then flung both arms out at the table. The table levitated a few feet into the air and flew, smashing into a billion pieces. Katerina escaped it by a hair. Nothing remained by dust and splinters where she had been cowering. All the chairs and beds in the room rose into the air in unison. Katerina and I ran in circles, dodging the flying furniture as it careened at us, guided by a once-kind soul now transfixed in a demonic yoga stance. The Exorcist, Meet Carrie. A chair slammed into my back, knocking me to the ground and stealing the wind from my lungs. I couldn't tell, but it looked like Katerina had been knocked unconscious by a bed. I tried to get to my feet but between the burns and the chair, I was in too much pain. Fuck it, I thought, and just laid there, thinking about what I felt like to rake in a pot in and stack towers of chips I could hardly see over. Build castles made of suckers money. And somewhere in the darkness, the gambler, he broke even, or whatever that dork sang. Jasmine began levitating, rising while locked in the same position. She looked towards Katarina's body, and it rose, limp as a deboned fish, to the same height. Jasmine wailing that same nonsensical shit. She looked at me and my blood came to a screeching halt in my veins. The symbol on Jasmine's forehead had come to life. It was an animated, thrashing, three-dimensional. It had stabbed itself through her skull, blood seeping out at the holes, and fusing itself with her brain. It wiggled and squirmed, pulsating with life. 
I felt my body rise into the air at her mind's command. Helpless, I soared across the room and into a wall. I wailed like an impudent toddler denied a treat as the bone in my left arm shattered, along with my hand and wrist. Vomit spilled out of me from the agony. All I could think was Katarina's tiny, strung out body wouldn't survive the airborne journey I'd just made. I braced, expecting Jasmine to send Katarina soaring. Much to my surprise, Katarina dropped down with a thud, and the door flung open. The team spilled in and began treating Katarina and me. Tiny flashlights checked our pupils. Fingers poked and prodded. They didn't touch or look at Jasmine. She was still hovering, her back unnaturally arched, her neck snapped back. I couldn't quite make out her face amidst the chaos. She was quiet now. I felt the sweet, sweet joy of the dragon as the morphine pumped in, my numb arm being gently positioned in a sling. Exit consciousness, stage left. On the way out, I saw Jasmine's head slowly turn towards me. There was no more symbol. Her forehead was now fully caved in. The edges of her destroyed skull jutted out. The gray matter of her brain was exposed, slowly seeping out, dripping juices down her face. The sounds of the pandemonium slipped away. Everything went quiet in this little corner of hell. I felt time slow. The only thing I heard as the blackness stole me was Jasmine's whisper. Jeknarkwarpuji. I saw her fall over dead as I sailed away into the nothingness of sleep. Posted by you slash Pappy. Strange. Life. Clinical Trial 87. Part 3. Day 3. Same story. No Jasmine, new furniture. The noxious smell of fresh bleach. A full cast had been put over my arm, stretching all the way to my fingertips. Katarina had a grapefruit-sized welt on her head. We sat in silence, her weeping quietly, me running the numbers. 50-50. If I were in the outside looking in, how much would I bet they took her next? Took me next? It was the proverbial, albeit rare, straight-up coin flip. The purest gamble. Her. 12 grand, she goes next. The poker player's mantra, fuck it, double up or go home. They dragged her away not long after. She didn't bother resisting or calling for help. I'm not a good man. Winner, winner, chicken dinner I cackled to the empty room, thinking how many times I'd heard that stupid joke as some donkey won a pot they didn't deserve. When they brought Katerina back, I was already in a corner, incoherently betting with myself. What fucked up power she would have. What part of her body would be different. How would she change in the night? I mostly babbled on about whether I'd live to see tomorrow. So far, I was two for two. Once, twice, three times a lady. Looking at Katerina, nothing immediately jumped out at me. The only perceivable difference was her mouth. It looked, swollen. A batter beamed in the mouth by a wild pitch. She stomped over to me, full of verve and swagger. I noticed her track marks were gone. She knelt, her face inches from mine, and never stopped talking. I mean, never. Not a breath between diatribes. Louder and louder. Not rudely, nothing aggressive or threatening. Just unabashedly engaged, energetic, spilling out stories and ideas and theories. All of them rife with delusional hope. A bright ball of demented sunshine. It was like someone fed Billy May six eight balls and asked him his thoughts on the infomercial market. Feral, but mostly innocent. I couldn't hear any of it. Not really. I was too transfixed in terror. Katarina's teeth were gone, replaced by four rows of ferocious incisors, all elongated and askew. Stalactites on top, stalagmites on bottom. And cave of fangs. Fuck. 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 Fucking creature feature. Eventually I slunk away to bed, holding my breath as I crept, wincing with each step. Katarina was still in the corner, manically staring at an empty wall and proselytizing at the top of her lungs. I tried to stay awake but inevitably passed out, wishing I had lost the coin flip. A wail from hell sent me running for cover. Katarina began screaming some new bullshit word at an impossible decibel level. My ears pounded, eardrums threatening to rupture. I finally summoned the little courage I ever had in this rotten world and looked at her. Katarina was on all fours, screaming repetitiously at an empty chair. Except Katarina wasn't Katarina. There is no animal to strictly compare her to, but she looked like a bear crossed with a wolf and, just for effect, throw in some fucking buffalo. Her torso was enormous and muscular, covered in a thick, deep brown shag. Somehow the nearly thousand pounds she must have weighed were supported by canine-like spindly legs that ended in paws. Each paw was festooned with probably 30-some-odd individual claws. The head looked like a yak, 
except six horns sprouted from her forehead. At least twenty rows of fangs apiece, top and bottom, gnashed with each incoherent, booming word she bellowed. I can't bluff here. I pissed myself. Katerina, if Katerina was even in there anymore, just kept roaring louder and louder. The room began shaking as if she'd summon an earthquake. I trembled and stared with holy dread. Her voice kept finding new heights. The walls began to buckle and crack. Drywall dust sprayed everywhere. The beast that was Katerina started bucking, kicking its legs back like a horse before slamming its massive horns into the walls, the chairs, the tables. One seriously fucked up rodeo. I heard myself sobbing, felt the warmth of fresh urine cascading down my legs. My collective injuries shot pain through my nerves with every reverberation. The pain in my ears was unbearable. A quick touch revealed they oozing blood. The Katerina creature eventually saw me and bellowed whatever word belonged to her at me. She, it began to slowly creep my way, horns in line with my throat. The room shook with every step. Fucking gore me already. I cried for death. My eardrums finally burst in an explosion of pain. I fell to the floor, the world silent as a snow-laden wintry morning, and felt pure terror as the beast slowly drew near. It was swishing its massive head dramatically, biting the very air with its endless teeth. There was only agony, only horror, only silence. That's all we were going to find in Clinical Trial 87. I felt the earth split with each stalking step. An old proverb came to mind. Hoping to recoup is what ruins the gambler. I was spellbound, watching my ruination approaching. I startled as the beast suddenly fell over with a crash and began spasming, convulsing and slamming its body with impossible force. I became airborne and slammed into the ground, again and again, feeling every wound rip anew. This unholy brute had made a sick trampoline of the world. I watched its hair dissipate, the skull morph, every bit of it disappearing before my eyes. All that was left was a tiny, frail, naked girl, trashing and bleeding on the broken tiles. The door flew open. The team poured through and began caring for me, naturally ignoring the dying Katerina. Opium spilled into my veins and my eyes rolled with pleasure as the overwhelming pain dulled. The world itself became a distant, lackadaisical suggestion. Katerina slammed herself over and over, wriggling about like a fish caught on a line, until she was facing me. The track marks had returned to her arms. She looked like her, except where a mouth should be was simply. Nothing. No lips, no teeth, no skin a gaping hole in her face where her mouth belonged, a black, empty thing. Like the middle of her face had been stomped away. She looked like something out of a bad zombie film, flaps of flesh hanging where a mouth should be. What a bad beat, I thought, chuckling to myself, driven wretched and mad by the sheer insanity of it all. I thought of Sunday school as a kid, stupid but safe, before it started down that lost highway. Standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city. For in one hour is thy judgment come. Babel, torment, and judgment. That's all we would find in clinical trial 87. My turn was next. At least I'd be spared hearing whatever the word was. Hooray for the sound of fucking silence. Katerina and I locked eyes, hers filled with that same animalism, as a mouth that wasn't there tried to open and shut, a grotesque caricature of chewing. I heard nothing. Thank whoever, until I was cheated. I don't know how, I don't fucking know how, but a single word screamed inside my mind, one I'd never forget. Baal Rinyantirak. The last thing I saw before sleep claimed me was the light slip out of Katarina's eyes forever. Posted by you slash Pappy. Strange. Life. Clinical Trial 87. Part 4. When I came to on the fourth day, I was alone. But I wasn't in the community room. No freshly painted walls adorned in that nauseating white. No chemical plume to choke on. Just memories of an eyeless mark, a mouthless Katerina. Jasmine with her skull crushed in, brain leaking out. As the opiates wore off, I began feeling nostalgic for the lone sharks. Sometimes you flip a coin and just lose. I found myself in a small room, the kind you imagined a suspected sex offender getting roughed up in on a TV police procedural. A table. A comfortable chair for me, an empty one across from me a pad of paper and a pen. Speakers hung from every corner of the room along with cameras watching from a dozen angles. My body was racked with pain as the morphine wore off. My burns screamed, broken bones ached, and the world was completely silent. I spoke, yelled, screamed. At least, I think I did. 
The only sensory feedback my body received was the feeling of my mouth moving and my heart breaking. My hearing was gone. I was deaf. The fear in me was melting away. I just felt the serenity of surrender. Enough pain and exhaustion will do that, I guess. All the chips were in the middle, whatever happens, happens. Thus spoke the gambler. A door opened and one of the team members wheeled in a television. He pointed at his eyes and then the TV, signaling for me to watch it. I nodded my head in assent. The drone left. Why fight the rising tide? For hours, a solitary word flashed across the screen. Dagged with narrow. Over. And over. And over. Nothing happened. Finally, the screen went blank. A few minutes later, the TV rebooted and words began to roll listlessly across the screen. Welcome to Clinical Trial 87, Subject 4. The fixed parameters of the trial dictate that an individual clinician explain in detail the necessary background information, along with instructions for successful trial completion. The loss of your hearing has altered this stage of the trial. Our RESARC indicates you do not know American Sign Language. As a result, necessity dictates we use a visual medium. The necessary background information is as follows. Three years ago, a team of archaeologists at an undisclosed location unearthed the remnants of a previously unknown early civilization. Carbon dating of the artifacts recovered revealed this civilization existed nearly 350 million years ago, predating dinosaurs by approximately 100 million years. The artifacts suggest the civilization was bipedal and humanoid. We cannot go into detail beyond that. For purposes of this trial, it is critical you understand the details of one artifact, a book. The textual language of the book does not correlate with any known historical language or pictographic lexicon. Neither artificial intelligence nor leading linguistic experts have been able to decode or translate any meaning within the text. However, the few experts permitted to review the text all experienced the same phenomena. Each reviewer became obsessively attached to a single, arbitrary symbol. Without any scientific basis, they were able to provide the word's pronunciation. We must redact all other experiential data regarding these initial reviewers. We have collected the pronunciations of 47 distinct words. We do not know the meaning of the words. Early clinical trials demonstrated that listening to the word being spoken repetitiously produced fundamental changes in test subjects. First, a rapid and dramatic change in personality, accompanied by a feeling of possessiveness of that word. Second, a significant change in a physical trial. Third, the acquisition of an inhuman ability. Fourth, a full transition of the subject state, followed by intense aggression and subsequent death. Experimentation has narrowed down the requisite exposure time frame needed to induce these changes. Early trials revealed any other speaker or listener is similarly exposed and subject to the same changes and risks. Current trials now use an AI voice modulator to insulate exposure solely to the clinical subject. Your instructions include some standardized guidelines. New procedures have been individualized for the specific needs of your trial. They are as follows. 1. You will likely die as a result of this trial. It is necessary to expose as many affected subjects to other non-affected subjects as possible to fully observe the process catalyzed by the word. However, latter and final subjects have witnessed consistent death of prior test subjects. Therefore, any attempt to deceive these subjects would add improper emotional variables. This is particularly true in your case, given your background in deception. Therefore, in the interest of full disclosure, there have been a total of 87 trials with four subjects per trial. No subject has survived a trial. All incidental speakers and listeners to earlier trials also perished. If you successfully complete this trial, upon your death all your outstanding debts will be paid and anyone WTH any meaningful connection to you will receive $20,000 a month for 24 months. 2. Circumstances have created a unique set of variables for your trial. A deaf subject has never been selected or utilized. This obviously precludes any audio delivery of the word's pronunciation. Past trials have shown that visual delivery of the word produces no quantitative or qualitative changes in the subject. Prior to these instructions, we delivered a word via speaker along with the same attempt at visual stimulation, which catalyzed no results in you. In an unprecedented step, you will be given the artificat. You are instructed to inspect every symbol in the text until your mind begins to understand one. Continue observing this symbol until its pronunciation becomes clear in your mind. When the pronunciation fully materializes, signal the camera. A team member will enter the room, and you will speak the word aloud only once. If the word is clear and audible, the team member will signal you with a thumbs up to proceed recitation of that word at that volume. 
Recite IT continuously at a slow, relaxed but consistent pace. If the word is inaudible or unclear, the team member will signal you by raising their hands palm up. Continue raise the volume of your voice and to try and clarify the pronunciation. The team member will signal you, then leave. 3. You will be monetized at all times via video with no audio. If IT appears you are feigning recitation or are attempting to otherwise undermine the trial, no debts will be paid, no monies will be distributed, and you will be terminated via lethal injection. Any attempt to overexpose or physically harm the team member will result in immediate termination by an armed guard. Any attempt to destroy or tamper with the text in will result in the same outcome. Your termination or suicide will result in no debts or monies being paid. One criterion for subject selection was a hopeless perception combined with a desperate need for a substantial amount of money. Successful completion of the trial is the only mechanism by which to satiate that need. 4. Based on the data collected, two working hypotheses have been generated regarding this artificat. 1. This book was some form of a holy book. 2. This book was used to create what humans later came to recognize and worship as deities. 5. Once you begin reciting the word you may do whatever you please, so long as the recitation continues. Write anything you would like on the pad with the pen and hold it up for the camera at the end of these instructions. No weapons or intoxicants are permitted. Water will be provided. 6. Recitation will take 7 hours, 7 minutes, and 7 seconds. You will then return to the community room for observation. If no changes are produced, the trial will continue the following day via a new medium. The trial will commence shortly. The TV screen went blank. I sat there, processing the sheer absurdity of it all. Hell is a door locked from the inside, and I jammed it shut. Time for one last game. A gambler only has one bit of sacred knowledge, the secret to surviving. Broke and bust, flush and riding the crest of the wave, a gambler keeps going. This, this was where that ran out. Oh well. I scribbled on the pad and held it up for the camera, my singular request. A deck of cards. The man with the box came through the door. Older. Late fifties. A sharply kept gray beard. Lab coat. No mask. No reason to hide anymore, I suppose. The box was made of jet black obsidian, adorned with a litany of deeply carved, bizarre symbols, each impossibly white. The man with the box sat it down, opened it, and removed a book. Bone. The book was made of bone. I bet the farm on it. Every inch of the cover was riddled with more of the unfamiliar characters. Peering closely, each was a confusing amalgam, a rune within a letter within a crude drawing. The man with the box sat down the book with some trepidation, took the pen, paper, and box, and left. He wouldn't meet my eyeline. Cowards don't belong at the poker table. I began gently flipping through the book. I'd given thought to destroying as much as I could of it. Save myself some pain with a quick bullet to the dome, maybe save the subjects of clinical trial 88 and beyond. I decided against it. I am not a good man. If I was going to die, I wanted to buy the ticket, take the ride. I wanted to see where the rabbit hole ended. Scared money don't make money. I systematically worked my way through page after page. Nothing meant anything to me. Until it did. I heard a whisper in my mind. Faint, at first. Like the disappearing memory of a once vivid dream, the last remnant of the echo in the cave. My eyes locked onto a single symbol, about halfway down a page, midway through the book. Picture the capital letter E, now breed it with a square, now slam it into a primitive drawing of giant snake. The voice in my head slowly grew with each repetition. A whisper became a mutter. A mutter became a statement. A statement became a snarl. A snarl became a scream. It didn't hurt or consume me. The voice, it felt like it belonged inside me. I don't know how long I'd been staring at the symbol. Minutes? Hours? I waved at the camera. The man with the box returned. I could see a guard waiting in the doorway, hand on a holstered pistol, earplugs in. I pronounced the word to a silent world, hoping some sound was coming out of my mouth. The man with the box smiled, gave me a thumbs up, took the book and gingery placed it in the box. He left me a fresh deck of cards and closed the door behind him. Fucker never met my eyeline. I began reciting the word, trying to match my exact volume. Hard to do when you can't hear a damn thing but I just went for the same strain and fluctuation in my throat. I figured I would err on the side of caution. Better to be too loud than too quiet. The voice in my head grew soft and then silent as I mutely called out the word. I aimlessly dealt me and no one across from me poker hand after hand, running out boards of community cards, and then checking who won. 
So far, the phantom was crushing me. I kept reciting the word. I could hear Hank Williams Sr. in my head, crooning, voice filled with regret, singing the lyrical tattoo that snaked its way across my upper back. Just a deck of cards, and a jug of wine, and woman's lies, makes a life like mine. The more I said the word, the more relaxed and comfortable I felt. The constant pain from my numerous wounds vanished. The world was becoming blurry, then black. Time lost all meaning. Seconds became hours, hours became minutes. Had they dosed me with morphine? What would be the point? When would they have even done that, anyway? They said no intoxicants, how would I be able to pronounce the word? I began rambling incoherently, and tremendous lightness filling me up. Now the only thing a gambling man ever needs is a suitcase, lord, and a trunk and the only time a fool like him is satisfied is when he's all stone cold drunk. Reality was unmistakably shifting. The darkness grew and the sights of this world were slipping away. I suddenly just stopped caring. About clinical trial 87. About anything. Except my word. I left this reality behind for another. The world was gone. And so was I. I sat alone in the utter blackness of the void. It was just me, my chair, the table, and an empty seat across from me. I dealt hand after hand, filled with an eerie tranquility. The dirge escaped from my lips, pregnant with every emotion I'd caged on the way down the ladder of life. Just a deck of cards, and a jug of wine, and woman's lies, makes a life like my fiveen. The words were sharp, clear. Unmistakable. My hearing had returned. Every ounce of pain was gone from my body. A cursory glance told me my wounds had vanished. And with each deal, I won every hand. Muttering, screaming, shouting it. A praise chorus, a call, a warning, a threat, a place to belong, a name. My word. My word. I began belting old Hank at the top of my lungs. I fell silent as I heard a sound, like a horse gently trotting along cobblestone, off in the distance. Come and see, and I saw. Someone, something was forming, approaching me, from the emptiness of the abyss. Into the darkness, I whispered my word, the only word that mattered. Nesk Fenitiklitik. Posted by you slash Pappy. Strange. Life. Clinical Trial 87. Part 5. On a the lasty day, a day that couldn't be measured in a place that defied time, I peered into the darkness. I was in awe, but I wasn't afraid. The rhythmic patter of hooves grew stronger. Something unearthly this way comes. The murderers with their lab coats and god-awful white walls and indifference had been correct, to a degree. They were bipedal. Humanoid might be stretching it. The creature emerged from the darkness, towering nearly 20 feet high. It had two legs, implausibly thick. A thick bark covered them, tree trunks that creaked and groaned with each movement. The bottom of its oaken legs gave way to thin, hairy calves, each ending with scarlet and black cloven hooves. Its body looked human, but disproportionately exaggerated. Muscles man just does not possess sprouted from its massive hairless torso and chest. Five spindly humanoid arms burst forth from each side of its body, swaying as though caught in a gentle summer breeze. Each hand was compromised of eleven fingers, all ending in razor-sharp, curved claws. Where a neck should have been, the slinky head of a snake curved nearly six feet upward. A complex face studied me. It was as though some deranged architect had blended the reptilian face of a snake with a man and a hyena. Splotches of fur sprouted from a rotund, greenish face. Four slits for eyes, the snout and tall, tufted ears of a wild dog, and the crooked smile of a man bobbed and weaved, like the mesmerizing death dance of a cobra, studying me. It was imposing and holy. A work that would make Doc Frankenstein weep with joy. It was beauty incarnate. Look upon my visage, ye mighty, and despair. Trying to convey what I saw strains my mind to this day. How else do you describe a god? A god? How did I know it was a god? Was it a god? How could it not be a god? How could it not be? A smile crept across its countenance as it sat across from me. It wasn't a demonic grin or a condescending smirk. Not the torturesome smile of a sadist nor the gleeful grin of a predator, prey firmly ensnared. It was the smile of, familiarity. Like two old friends who happened to run into one another in this boundless chasm. It checked the two cards I had dealt, read the board, and spoke in a voice that sprang from everywhere but its mouth, rebounding off the nothingness from every conceivable direction. I don't think my tens are good here. Its words were velvety, its voice kind and intense. It flipped over its cards, revealing a king and a ten for a pair of tens. I was awestruck. 
Still, I felt no fear. Yeah, afraid not. I donked two pair. I flipped over a queen and a ten, two pair. I hit a three outer against a god. Not to make a pun but, Jesus. It smiled warmly. Pot's yours. I chuckled at the joke until I saw what it meant. There was something in the pot. The head of the man with the box. I pulled the severed head toward me gratefully. Good hand, I said, genuinely. Its grin widened, half Cheshire cat, half all-knowing father. Before I deal this next hand, it would be rude of me not to ask your name, I think it would be rude of me not to ask. I apologize if it's rude to ask. I wasn't frazzled. I couldn't explain it. I just, liked it. Felt an unspoken kinship. I wanted it to like me. Ah, we're gamblers, you, and me. Fated forever to ride the turns of chance as we outwit weaker minds. Where the foolish see only luck and fate, we see information. Incomplete information to be used for our empowerment. Just as I know you are not Tom, but Pappy. And there is much unsaid I can learn there. But, just the same, you know my name. It's how we got here. To this place, to this time, to this moment. The word that had etched itself into my mind. The word I'd been casting soundlessly in the trial. The word that ate away the world. My word. Its name. Neskfenitiklitik. Its snake-like head bobbed and weaved, beaming from ear to ear. That is my name. Though you are certainly the first of your kind to know it, let alone speak it. You have many questions. I can smell them all, feel them coursing through the air. Some I will answer. Some, I won't. I am one of the before. At some point, every god or goddess imagined by this world has quite been real. The various peoples of your realm dreamt up new ones, and they invariably matched one of us in likeness or characteristic, for we are infinite and always, each bound to a unique, singular aspect. The before closest to your imaginings would breathe life into that deity, and it would live on so long as the people kept it alive. Followed it, worshipped, honored it. Your world is merely one an incalculable number in a single, infinitesimal reality among an infinite number of realities. Just one stop among many for us in our infinite loop of all that is. In every iteration of every being across existence, if they create something conceptually greater, we breathe life into it. We have our reasons. Your tormentors. These men and women who foolishly meddled with what they didn't understand to bring you here are upstarts without any semblance of knowledge or insight. Their ignorance and arrogance are matched only by their cruelty and cupidity. They drown in the blood of your kind yet feel nothing. Such has forever been the nature of those who claw for power they neither deserve nor are suited for, anywhere life is to be found. Pitiful worms recklessly seeking cosmic power. You have seen the deaths, Pappy. An unholy specter, a sacrilegious mockery of our work. Your fellow subjects died gruesomely because they were force-fed the name of one of the before. This artificial ritual is an abomination of the very nature we wrought. Our names are the embodiment of power, the very essence of sacred knowledge. They are ours to give, to pass on in part to the worthy. To know a name is to being inundated with a piece of us. These poor souls were not chosen by the before. They were unwitting sacrifices. To survive the passing, to grow into something more and be deified, the host must share the aspect with the giver's name. They must be characteristically bound, molded from the same clay, for each of the before is the beginning image of all beings. This book they foolishly toy with is not holy text. It is a record of who we are, a collection of our names, and the conduit by which we pass along ourselves. A billion, a trillion, a quadrillion, beings, measured in numbers you cannot fathom, share traits with one of us. Among that endless grassland, when a civilization imagines divinity that strikes at the heart of the aspect of us, we painstakingly choose a single, worthy stalk of grass to embody us. The personification of one of us left behind, forever linked, a potent and dangerous bond. Those few chosen are given the book and permitted to discern a singular truth, for they shall find nothing but confusion, save the one name from whose bosom they sprang. That's why those meddlers who first found the book on your planet did not die. They did not find a name unbefitting of them. Rather, they discovered a path back to the beginning, to the one with which who they aligned, for the before are endless and all reaped from us. These selfish interlopers found what I suppose they thought were gods that might be forced to give them untold power. Presumptive simpletons. To discern us is to call to us, nothing more. We built the very fabric existence, weaving it from the nothingness, vomited light into the dark. Nothing binds us. We might hear the whisper of our name from some errant mortal, but we throw away the unworthy. Your captors did not tell you of the fate of those of their lot who first called out the names. Tongues and eyes burned out. Heads eaten. 
bodies left limbless. Each of the before has its own method to punish the impudent. And yet, what did they do in their lust, their greed, their careless pursuit of a power they could never possibly tether? Their brethren became more brazen. In their cruelty, they shoved the unquantifiable power of the before into the bodies of unwilling, desperate souls. Ignorance breeds death. Thus, it always has been. They tried to deify your compatriots, make weapons of you all, with callous disregard for your fates. To inject the aspect of one of the before into a being who shares no link, no kinship, bears no reflection, poor souls. That, as you've seen, only ends in destruction. Their cruel mechanism gave us no role, save unwitting executioner. We could not confront the speaker, yet the listener was imbued with just a fraction of our aspect. A fraction of improper omnipotence is damnation. A paper cup cannot hold acid, pappy. The vessel must be suitable for the inhabitant. You saw what this bastardization wrought. Instead of fulfilling a right, it warped the victim. The failed alignment creates a monster, fueled by pain, possessing powers it shouldn't, a toxic phantom invariably ripping it apart. Though we witnessed this cruel charade, we chose not to intervene. You may think this callous, vicious even. These trespassers pose no threat to the before, and as for you and your cohorts, we do not partake in justice or concern ourselves with it. We are simple artisans who breathe life into ideas. We do not rule or pass sentence. We have our reasons. Nesk Fanny beamed at me. But you, you redefine the game. By accident. By luck. By chance. By fate. With, your gamble. You went deaf. They made you discern from the book, and you found the only name you could ever find. Mine. The only one who could imbue you with the aspect. The only one who could deify you. For I am recklessness, the knife's point, the razor's edge, unpolluted chance, the one who gives all meaning to luck, the bursting nightmare of peril and reward, fortune incarnate, the exuberance of wild victory, the crush of breaking defeat, the beginning of all risk, the deceiver, the games man. I am the gambler. And you, all gamblers, flow from me. Nesk Fanny reached out with ten hands and touched my forehead gently, a father caressing the prodigal son, finally home. Come and see, and I saw. Visions spiraled and swirled through my mind. Infinite games of chance on limitless of levels of existence, all measured by luck and skill. Foreign beings, some hardly tangible, all seeking the rush of wit, risk, and fortune. All born from the gambler. All bound to Nesk Fenny I wanted to play them all. Every game, for all time. Nesk Fenny chuckled heartily. You truly are of my ilk. While I do despise what they have done to you, to all those lost, I have no interest in justice. Even though I do like you. Oh, my son. Though you won't die by my hands, you won't gain anything from me. Just this little peek at sacred knowledge for a moment before they undoubtedly kill you. For you see, your world does cry out for a manifestation of a gambler. It careens ever closer toward self-immolation as risk scales to the whole of your species. Still, I did not choose you. You merely stumbled upon me. This right is older than the fabric of space and time. The before do not give gifts, and we are not found. We are the finders, we are those who bind. I am sorry. I grinned at the infinite, the god before the gods. I risked it all. If I lose, I lose. It was worth the bet. That's who we are. I want nothing from you. Ask nothing from you. Here, at the end, my heart is full. You are somewhere I belong. I've never had that. A few moments with made this all worthwhile. I meant it with every fiber of my being. Cacophonous laughter echoed throughout our empty cosmos. Are you ever one of mine? I have no interest in justice. Nesk Fanny's four snake-like eyes narrowed, mischievously, a wry grin spreading. But a gamble for everything? Death or power? That's just my game. What do you say? One shot. You win, I'll make you a god of this little rock, gift you a part of my aspect, deify you. Power beyond measure every choice available to you. The god of gamblers. You lose, I send you back and they kill you. I perked up. But, I thought the before only empowered who they selected. I found you, not the other way around. Did you? Did you find me? Maybe an endless series of gambles, my invisible hand, guided you here. I do like to bluff. It doesn't not matter. You are right, I did not select you. Not directly. So, let's see what chance says. After all, it is born from me. Shit, they're gonna kill me anyway, so I'm free or all in. Let's do it. We laughed together, 
something boundless and something tiny, tied together by the love of dancing on the edge. I know poker is your game. A hand of that? Perhaps one of the games you saw in your mind? I can give you all the knowledge you need of any game to put us on even terms. The gamble means nothing to me if I steal an edge. The game must be fair. It's, it's up to me? Yes. And I promise you, the odds will be even. I will limit myself and every element to match yours exactly. Give myself over to the blind purity of it. I trust you completely, Nesk more than I would any wretched human. Humans cheat. You, you would burn this all down before you would pollute the integrity of the game. The before chuckled. One of my children, indeed. I can't help but cheer for your victory. I sighed contentedly. Choosing your own terms, that's really all a gambler gets. That's the dream. If it's up to me, I choose the flip of a coin. A single toss. 50-50. Winner takes all. No skill, the purest, simplest, gamble. The flip of a coin for it all. Ten hands crash together in thunderous applause. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Let us find truth in blind luck. Oh, my son, may fortune favor you. The before produced a quarter from nothingness and held it out in one its ten hands. Nesk Fanny Tyclitic looked me square in the eye. Heads or tails? Call it in the air. The coin went spinning twenty feet up. Tails. Tails. Always tails for the man who never made it. My manic voice rang full and true. I screamed like a giddy child as Nesk Fanny Tyclitic roared with a deep laugh, his head forever bobbing and weaving. The quarter landed perfectly in its palm. Without looking, Nesk Fanny Tyclitic smacked the coin on top of another hand, flipping the coin as it went. The before removed one of its many hands to reveal the outcome. Tails. I leapt and cheered in maddening jubilation and thought nothing of the prize to come. The only thought that permeated me was I had gambled with the fabric of existence, my maker, and finally, came out ahead. Frozen, I realized, this was bad form. Take your victory in stride. Don't run down the loser. I'd lost my head in the frenzy. But much to my delight, Nesk Fanny Tyclitic was whooping and hollering, writhing and dancing in delight. Not only had the before been rooting for me, I realized, but it cared nothing of winning and losing. It cared only for the ritual. Its aspect. The gamble itself. We both settled back into our chairs, awash in laughter, like old, drunk friends catching up. Well earned, little one. Take your winnings. In front of me on the table hovered a staggering purple light and a book made of bone. Grab the light. When you arrive back, take the book with you. What you do from there on is your concern. I shall never interfere. I looked at the severed head of the man with the box. Is, is that real? No. Just an illusion I thought might comfort you. But, if you want vengeance, take it. Kill them all. Or don't. It's your affair. But remember, you are created by my hand. You house a part of me, the sacred aspect. I care not about reputation, bloodshed, or justice, but you must always keep the purity of the gamble. Every day, your kind gambles. The throw of the dice by the man playing with his rent money. The old and dying putting it all on one spin. Puny leaders betting entire economies on phantoms and rumors. Chancing your very survival with weapons of enormous power while you slowly melt the world. You must watch over our kind. This is your duty. They all cry out, silently, for a new kind of God. The time for deities promising moral limitations and redemptions has long passed your world by. Your kind cares only about what they can gain by pushing luck to its limits. They cry out for me, though they do not know it. And our game has chosen you. You will need followers. You must find them. You must. You shall only keep your powers so long as they keep you. Keep the gamblers close. You need them as much as they need you. Beyond that, take your vengeance, exude your wrath, consume, build, destroy, be vast, soak in endless riches, do as you see fit. The booming echo of Nesk Fanny Tyclitic filled every part of my mind with words I would never forget. From its mouth, the before finally spoke, quietly, serenely, the picture of comfort. I trust you. We are one. Grab the light and take the book. Find your new name. Nesk Fanny Tyclitic. Thank you. Truly. I will do my duty. But, allow me one curiosity. The artifacts. The book. Why were they there? Those Muppets thought they found an ancient civilization, but the before are so, so very much more than that. Why were those things there? Nesk Fanny Tyclitic grinned mischievously. 
I always leave a site behind with a book. Everywhere we are, everywhere we go. Over enough time, enough chances, enough experiments, enough trials, I find one more gamble with something, something of that place, a creature born of me. The odds are astronomical, beyond your comprehension, to be sure. Think of all that had to happen for us to have this coin toss. All the events, the lives lost, all the little details that had to align. But across infinity, I'm willing to take that gamble. My bet paid off. It's always worth it. I just can't say no to a bluff or a chance to play with risk. As I said, did you find me? Or did I find you? Nesk Fanny Tyclitic smiled wickedly, proudly. Protect the book, for it is tethered to this place. See these insects never besmirch the before again. Beaming at Nesk Fanny Tyclitic, I took up the book and grabbed the purple light. One last look at my maker. Power one is twice as sweet as power earned. Omnipotence coursed through my veins and filled all the holes I'd carved inside me while rolling down that lost highway. I found myself sitting alone in the same room at clinical trial 87, the book in my hand. The door crashed open. Men in white lab coats and armed guards with guns drawn spilled into the room. A dozen gun barrels aimed at my head. A bevy of nervous scientists staring apprehensively at the book. My voice rebounded from every corner of the room, my lips never moving. Don't you want to know before you kill me? Don't you want to know it? I spoke with a different timbre, sly, villainous, rife with mischief. The deceiver. A word began as a whisper in my mind, over and over, growing louder and louder, until it became perfectly clear. The man with the box nervously approached me. I didn't look at him. What you saw? The secrets behind all of this? How to use the book? What lies beyond? Who these gods were? The pathetic mortal's voice trembled as he asked the god more than he should have. No. My fucking name. Every gun in the room fired at once, an endless series of perfect shots. Blood and viscera splattered and rained from the heads of every guard and scientist blown wide open, save the man with the box. The word in my mind. It grew to perfect clarity. My name is Nezoilesh. I am the god of gamblers. Come and see. I considered the whimpering, puny thing before me, smiling wickedly. I pulled a coin forward from the nothingness. The mortal tried to run, but no one runs from a god. 50-50. Call it in the air. You win, you live. You lose, you die like the rest of this putrid infection. I flipped the coin. The murderous little beast wept and plead for its life. Call IT. My voice echoed inside his very mind, forcing him to decide. T, T, tails. 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 Always tails for the man who never made IT. The coin landed in my left palm. Without looking, I slapped it on top of my right hand. I removed my left hand to reveal his fate. Tails. You win. I kept my duty and let the maggot keep wriggling. Standing up, I grabbed the book and began walking out. Bodies flew against the walls and ceiling, clearing a path for me. Screams echoed throughout the building as previously unseen team members felt their eyes explode, their skulls implode, their necks turn and snap, had their innards torn out by my will. The man in the box wept in the corner. The walls of the clinic tumbled away as I walked out into the world. My world. I looked back one time at the man with the box, alive and still bawling. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. The sun was bright, the wind was soft, and everything, forever, lay before me. I sang my song unto the earth. Just a deck of cards, and a jug of wine, and woman's little fives, makes a life like mine. Like I said, I'm not a good man. I strolled out, looking for a game. I leave this story, at its end and beginning, behind for you, dear reader, not as a cautionary tale or a record of mankind's savagery. We have enough of those. Rather, to ask a simple question. Do you have enough gamble in you to follow me?